So that would be that kind of overlap where a seller and a buyer both kind of um, can agree to something, so they may agree to the seller's lowest rate for the price to sell and the buyer's highest rate for the price. Complaining about that, 
Get off your high horse. Okay? Everybody in this class had that opportunity, didn't they? Everybody had that opportunity, right? To be an organizational citizen. Everybody, right? Boy, was there a lot of light whining a week ago, right? Oh, sad sorry. And you abuse these two people, shame on you for doing that. And shame on the rest of you for not standing up and saying, I call buckshot. Shame on you. Am I clear enough? And maybe some of the people who should be hearing this, maybe you're the choir. But that's just straight up. There are ethical dilemma when people do not honor their obligation to their stakeholders when they have an obligation, by the way. If you got a problem, I got big shoulders. I'm tough, that's me. Or do you want some cheese to go with that wine? Is that unfair? I don't think so. Trust has a substitute. When we don't trust somebody, what do we do? We create a contract, right? To protect ourselves because you gotta hold your wall, right? If you don't trust somebody, you create a, a union, right? So trust is the key to any relationship. And trust assumes a mutuality of obligation, of ethical duty, of rights, correct? have a recognition of a expected duty consisting of a psychological contract, correct? And that psychological contract is often not mutually understood. Fair enough? I had a, a team come into my office yesterday. They sat down. I said, have you prepared to talk about this topic? Uh, no. What was my psychological contract? Oh, they're coming to talk about something and make a presentation. Yeah, they'll be prepared. Do they want me to spoon feed them? Yeah. The contract? No. Master's program? Prepare yourself, right? Fair? No. I think your group has been done a great disservice. You've been spoon fed. What's our population here? Would everybody in class know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. How do you get participation points if you don't have them? And the cheating that went on on Monday was appalling. I was upset. Excuse me, you're? I was cheating in a negotiation. How do you cheat in a negotiation? You look at the other side, you had your own sheet, and somebody else said, well, you don't know. You're not supposed to share that information. There were rules, right? It was appalling. I didn't sleep at all one day after this. It all. Like you said, I was in the hospital on this day. What's my point? You've got a moral obligation, and everybody in an ethical dilemma situation has a moral obligation to say, how do we solve this problem? And do we create a relationship based on trust? What do we do? If no trust is present and the relationship is arm's length, you've got a real difficulty because it becomes exponentially more difficult. Tough choices become much harder. Participants typically fail to uh, look for a global solution that addresses the needs of the entire community. And as a result, bad decisions almost inevitably result. Let me give you an example. Many of the other cities in in Wayne County, Detroit, negotiated the table for their employees to give back salary that they previously been granted. How do you think that made the firefighters and police feel in those cities? Pretty old, bad. We didn't do that. Everybody got a raise in our city because we created a high trust relationship. What did we do? We brought in the Federal Mediation and Consolidation Service, conducting training for the entire organization. Everybody could attend. And we said, what kind of organization do you want this to be? We've got a problem, but it's our problem. It's 
heart problem. It's not a specific problem, it's not a firefighter's problem. We've got to solve this together. And we created a series of monthly meetings with every single department having labor on one side of the table and management on the other, talking about the question of what can we do to do this better? And we created a high trust relationship. It's called it by the way a high trust work system or a high performance work system. If you are interested and interested in really making a difference in your organizations and in your careers, you might want to consider studying it. Because it's the kind of relationship between people and organizations, it's not only negotiations best but based, but more importantly, it's relationship and trust-based. And all the data say that companies that adapt such a system or managers that adopt such an approach are exponentially, measurably more financially profitable, they have better customer service, they have reduced turnover. All those things enable a company to do much better. Here are the elements of an ethical dilemma. Ms. Miller, would you read these for us, please? <coughs> a perceived duty is owed to, to another party or parties. Conditions involved make the achievement of expected and desired results difficult or impossible to achieve. The alternatives are all likely to result in at least a short-term loss for all parties. The relationship is perceived as being in crisis as a result of the bad options available. <coughs> and shutting down communication often occurs. The only choices are between two or more bad options. So you're in a situation where it looks desperate, but there are ways out. And certainly it was a whole lot more difficult than a couple oranges that we had to deal with, but we had some pretty fun excuses. Pardon me, solutions, not excuses. The first thing we did was attempt to make a genuine and sincere, and sincere connection with the other parties. And we did that successfully. And we brought in resources that enabled them to say, we're not just talking here, folks. We're engaging you as participants in looking at a really disastrous problem. The biggest issue is to first of all define what the problem is, and that's often the hardest issue. Now, one of the things we did to solve that with that four or three council, did anybody know what a city council does? They're like the Republicans and the Democrats, they fight, right? We have a four or three council, four on one side, three on the other. They wouldn't agree on the time of day. We brought all seven into a room, and we said, okay, we're gonna go around the circle, Name a problem you think that is facing the city that we need to address. Ended up with 114. Gave everybody 10 votes. First vote was actually worth 10 points, second vote was worth nine. And the city council members were then able to say, from that 114, I think we should focus here. We ended up with 12 major goals. First time they would agreed in a long, long time and defined the problem. And we looked at the result and not its cause. There was no finger pointing. It was an opportunity to bring people together and say, what's the problem? And when you address an ethical dilemma in that way, you got shot. And then you agree as to the nature of the problem. And you have to put that in writing. You have to get very precise on that. Typically, this is where things fall down. We spent a lot of time working on creating within the city council a establishment of what there in fact was agreement on the problems. And the number one problem that we agreed on was that the issues about planning and about the need to do a much better job over the long term and, and looking at where the, where the uh, entire program was gonna go as a city and delivering services given the fact that we had to re-strategize so that planning issue is the number one issue. And we documented the problems by identifying metrics as to what we are trying to accomplish. Knowing your vulnerabilities is a critical issue. What makes us most at risk? The big risk for city council members, interestingly enough, is the same as the big risk for elected officials at the national level. They want to get reelected. What a concept. Anybody ever hear Robert Reich? Not 
a businessman. You know who Robert Wright was? Secretary of Labor. Uh, Bill Clinton. Now a professor at UC Berkeley. Brilliant man, about this tall. Uh, talking head a lot on TV. I was in Harvard in 1982 and uh, was at a seminar for senior executives. And uh, he made a presentation from his book, The Next American Frontier. And then he, he said, America's facing four critical problems that it has to immediately face. Oh, that's a lot of major, major set of problems. Four problems were, we've got to invest in our infrastructure. It's going down the tubes. And if you pay any attention, you know, in San Diego and New York, Illinois have had major problems with the deterioration of their infrastructures and bridges falling down. Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan are in receivership, We've gone upside down, bankrupt. Second issue he said was our educational system. Our K-12 system now ranks where in the world, you know? Oh, we're 17. But it's a knowledge list and an information-based society economy, isn't it? And if our if our educational system is in shreds compared to other companies, how are we going to countries? How are we going to compete on an international basis? Third issue was R and D, research and development. We're getting killed, by the way, by the by the Germans and the people from Asia with regard to innovation. I don't know if you knew that, but that's the case. Part of it's labor cost issues. Part of it's tax issues. Part of it's Simply the fact that healthcare is socialized in so many other countries, and that 14%, which is the average cost, in fact, it was the number one cost item when you were buying a car. Health insurance for the guys in the line. True story. And that put America in a really difficult position with regard to r &D. And the fourth issue was something called paper entrepreneurialism. Ever hear that? Paper entrepreneurialism is creating financial wealth on paper with things like the credit default swaps that led us to the 2000. I thought, well, gee, was everybody knows about that, but then I realized that some of you were in the fourth grade when that was still in. Um, the reality is that the fiscal crisis facing the United States is a result of paper entrepreneurialism. The Enron problem, the World Cup problem, all examples of misuse of accounting systems we can give credit to, to Ryan Craig for that, by the way, of completely dis, dismantling the uh, Security Exchange Commission banking regulation system. But that's what was happening. Of course, that was what uh, what Wright was talking about. Here's the issue on that. Defining the concerns is critically important in understanding their impact if we don't understand what the vulnerability is. If we don't understand the nature of the problem, did we know the problem back in 1982? Robert Wright identified it. Was it a bestseller on Wall Street? Pardon me, on, 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 um, in New York? Yep, yeah, on the New York Times? Yep, yeah. New York Times bestseller. Congress knew about it. How many years ago was 1982? Let me see, that's 37 years ago. And what did they do? Bumpkus, Zilch, Nada. We still have those problems today. In fact, we, your work, certainly. So what we understand in the impact has to be related to our ability to determine where we're vulnerable and what the risks are. What were the consequences? Merrill Lynch no longer exists. It's now America Bank, Merrill Lynch. They were combined and bought out. Washington Mutual, one of the biggest banks in the United States, went under. Lehman Brothers no longer exists. The decision was made to cut the plug and let them go down the drain. They were, we're talking about a huge part of our entire investment system. Too big to fail? No. But the consequences were profound on the economy. Jobs were lost by 20% like of businesses and lost in the major positions. We went into the steepest economic decline since the 1920s, is that right? Evaluate the alternatives. Bounded rationality and bounded moral reasoning are the two issues. You probably don't know what they mean. How many know what bounded rationality means? Very basic business term. 
you need to understand the vocabulary for you to be considered credible when you go out on the street. Okay? Bounded rationality means there's a limited amount of information available or too much information from which we can struggle to make choices because we're swamped by it. So we look at a bounded set of options and in so doing, miss many available options. Sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. If we're missing critical information and we're Sometimes it's called a garbage can approach, literally. That's what it's called in management theory. You go to the garbage can and you look at what's available there in the garbage can of what you're familiar with already and you make a decision. Not an optimization approach. Bounded moral reasoning is very similar. We're going to make a decision based upon what we think is the consequence that we use as the measure of our ethical filter. Oh, what's that mean? I'll give you an example. What's the right thing to do in a particular circumstance if there's someone with a profound need or someone who receives a profound loss? How do we manage that situation? What about if there's an issue where there's a legal requirement? What about if we're so concerned with rules that we forget purpose? Oakland saw in the 1950s, sick that I know this, in a 1956 book called Personnel Management called Public Personnel Administration, the Conquest of Technique Over Purpose. That's a problem. So when we look at issues and say, how do we define what we know, we've got to keep in mind what are our values and what in fact is the information available? Do we know what we know? How many of you know the definition of insanity? You probably do. What's that? Same thing, Same thing over and over, only for a different result. Often we use that same approach. Oh, I used this approach last time at work, therefore I'm going to use this approach until the cows come home. Um, not a good strategy. Not when there are lots of issues involved that can become really critical to the nature of the decision that's involved. You have to understand. What's the difference between an opinion and a fact? What's an opinion? Something that's impartial. Yeah, subjective perception. What's a fact? Proof of evidence, right? Is there a difference? I have a friend who used to say, opinions are like belly notes. Everybody's got one. The last person you cared about yours was your mother, and it was a long, long time ago, right? <laughs> um, and they get to confuse us. And we look at what's going on, and we say, well, I think this, and I think that. And most often, we make those decisions based upon not really knowing what all the information is because of that bounded rationality problem or the bounded moral reasoning problem. And we find that we're in a real pickle making decisions that are really very self-destructive. Let me ask you the question this. Do you want to know the truth about how you shape up as a future employee, or do you want somebody to, to treat you like a mushroom? You know how they treat you like a mushroom? You keep in, they keep you in the dark and they cover you with manure. That's how they raise mushrooms. Okay? Right? True story? Those of you who are mushroom growers, you don't want that. What did Max Dupre say in his book, Leadership is an Art? What Dan Caldwell quoting all these people that he read about. Well, maybe he actually knows something. Maybe his 25 years of practitioner experience maybe the fact that he's written 103 journal articles and, eight, and 12 books means that he actually knows what he's talking about. Or maybe he's just full of that manure. Who knows? How would you guess? think that was fed? You get the message. 
don't you ever treat each other bad. Take down that damn chat line. It's toxic. And you know it. Shame on you. What kind of a culture do you want? You want to be treated like children or like adults? Do you know what the... Who, who are the psych people here again? Okay, transaction analysis. What's, what's it all about? Do you know? Eric Byrne. No? There are three ego states. Parent, adult, child. If you treat somebody like a parent, you preach to them like I'm doing right now. Because you're acting like children. Damn it. We clear here. When you're a child, you whine. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, this is unfair. According to what? According to an opinion or according to a fact? Right? Oh. And an adult to adult relationship is one where we treat you with respect because you earn being respected. Not where you abuse those two people who really did a hell of a lot for you, didn't they? They put the entire course into one paper and you treat them lightly. You know what? This next step is critical. This is the ethical step. When you're dealing with people in an organization and you've got to explain an ethical problem, you've got things you have to do. And this all comes from LaRue Hosmer from Michigan, who's one of the greatest ethicists in the history of the United States based upon his research contribution to decision-making models. He wrote a book called The Ethics of Management, an amazing book. And here's his model. You understand the moral standards. What is the basis by which you make moral decisions? And that's both instrumental or outcome-based and normative value-based. What are the moral impacts on stakeholders? What are the consequences on the people who are affected? How are their rights determined and affected? How about the harm that's created? How about the benefit that's created? And then you say, what's our moral problem? What's the moral problem for you? How can we best qualify MSV students to have a shot at a successful career in business when they don't have a business background? And completely, many of you don't even know how to do research or write. In fact, many of the papers I got were written at the 10th grade level and would have gotten C in the 10th grade. Did you know that? Yeah, you knew that because you got my feedback. Yeah. Am I finished grading? Well, if I don't have your paper graded, send it to me again, I'll grade it. I even had a whole 116 documents sent to me. So if I don't have it graded yours, send it to me, please. I was pretty good. I got uh, Miss Todd yesterday sent me her paper. I had it right back to her. Same thing with Mario. I got it right back to him yesterday. Anyway, so. Once you determine the moral problem, then you look at the issue of what are the economic, legal consequences, also what's the uh, uh, ethical consequences and duties and vows. And then you propose a moral solution. And what you do with that is you define all that and say, oh, this is what I considered when I made this decision. I looked at the impact of each of the alternatives. I evaluated those impacts. I defined the problem. I considered it based upon these three criteria. And this is what I think I should do. What do you think? Right? Does that make sense? And then identify a course of action with the other party. That's a critical part of the process. So we were there in Garden City, Michigan, and uh, we had all the facts out on the table, we opened the books, every single department. Here's the, here's the money, here's our revenues, here's last year's expenditures. How are we going to make this happen? So employees said, well, we can 
can we contribute to the solution? So we said, sure. So we had more than 100 employees with recommendations. We had some problems. One of the problems was that the fire chief, who had been there a long time, interesting guy. I said, Chief, you want to go through solving this problem? He said, nope. So he stepped out and retired. Probably a good thing. Because his heart was there. He loved the guys and he knew there was going to have to be some changes. Well, as I think I told you, yes, Monday, yes, we said they had a parade in my honor around City Hall, a picket, you know, because they didn't want to change the dispatch system. Ultimately, we hired a new fire chief, and uh, we did some really unusual things. I was the first city manager in the United States to attend a national fire yet with my fire chief sitting next to each other as the executive development program of the National Fire Academy identified best practice for municipalities. And I said to the chief, whatever they tell us there, I'm ready to buy into. How about you? And he said, sounds like a deal. Well, here's the rest of that story. Cities like LA, Dallas, big city fire departments with hundreds and hundreds of employees typically send five employees a year to the fire camp. Training, training provided by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Evansburg, Maryland is what it's about. Really great place. Actually, the best conference I've ever attended, and I attended much better than the Harvard conference. So I'm there with, with uh, Keith, Keith Nam's a wonderful guy, and we're having fun, and just eating it up. And these, these other fire, fire chiefs from other departments are saying, what in the world are you doing here, city manager? Aren't you the enemy? No, I'm your friend. So we got home, and uh, that year we had, remember Los Angeles and Dallas had five, we had eight of our 35 firefighters went to the fire academy that year. Because the academy said, we want to work with you. There's something unusual. You're working together. We think that's cool. So there was a big article in the National Fire Chief Magazine about what we accomplished, and it was a lot of fun. And then when we got to the budget season, what we, we did some really smart things. We had the, I told you we had the federal mediator in there, and uh, we had this labor management committee set up, and every month we'd meet. We had promotional exams for the fire department, and the guys wanted that. That was a big deal, because it meant significant income for them to get a raise and uh, to be promoted. So we said, well, how should we create the, uh, the exam? And uh, I said, well, here's this book. It's the International City Management Association puts out a book on virtually every topic. And one of them was on National Fire Service. And that was the book that we got. We said, well, does this look like a pretty good source of what we ought to be holding people accountable to? And they said, oh yeah. And I said, well, while we run the class, anybody who wants to get promoted can take the class. In fact, anybody who doesn't want to be promoted can take the class because it can only help you learn, right? And he said, that's a pretty good deal. In fact, they got an extra day's vacation completely in the class. Just for a firefighter that's, do the math, 24 hours times what they make per hour, they did pretty well. But they said, well, who's gonna teach the class? And I said, well, who do you want to teach the class? And they said, well, there's somebody over here, and this guy from the National Fire Service, and this guy over here from this inspector from this big city, and this guy over here who's head of training for this other big city, can we have them teach? And I said, well, why not? He said, well, would you pay to have them come in to give them a little stipend? Why not? So they bought the promotional process pretty clean with me because they were owners of them. They were part of the solution. We honored an ethical duty to them. And how about that? And you know, Keith Nibbs and I were sitting there at the table, one on this other side, the entire officer board of the fire department union presented the budget to the city council. 
And we're saying, yep, we agree. Whose budget was it? Whose part of the solution was it? That's a negotiated relationship, folks, based upon information, based upon trust, based upon relationships, based upon assumption of ethical duty. Those are critical issues related to negotiations. That's collaboration, and that's a way forward that creates a sustainable future. Let me tell you the rest of that story. At the end of the contract, we were the only city in the history of the state of Michigan that negotiated a contract with our firefighters with neither side having an attorney present. We were the first city in the state of Michigan to negotiate a performance-based compensation system with the Teamsters Union. Did we have high trust culture? You can have whoever you want to teach negotiation. It may not be me. But if you get somebody else, you're not going to get anywhere close. That's a tough one. When I interviewed for the job when I was 16, Dr. Clark said to me that Karen said he was the only qualified candidate of the 19 who had to apply. I may not be the next one. Jonathan Clark and I met today. He says, I have had more complaints about your class than in any other class from any other instructor in the last two years. plan together. Obviously we did it in Garden City because we worked together, didn't we? We figured out a way to develop a plan of action that treated people like they were used and not yet say so owners and partners. Again, what's that all about? That's what a high performance work system does. And I venture to say that nobody in this room other than Camp Caldwell knows what a high performance work system is. And yet it's the most important management of innovation that's hit human resource management in the last 15 years. And the empirical evidence is incredibly strong and it's the key to create healthy negotiated relationships. What do you do when you create an implementation plan? You say to people, hey, We need people to buy in. RJ, we need you to archive this class because 30% of the people aren't here, right? <clears throat> Ms. Patel, Ms. Thornley, are you interested in helping write a paper that can be presented to the entire class as the foundation for the entire class? Yeah. And people bitched and moaned like they got stuck by a hot iron. And you know, you heard it. I wasn't here, but I heard about it. Again, shame on whoever said that. Everybody had an opportunity to be an organizational citizen. An organizational citizen is someone who, who is involved with extra role behavior that benefits the organization that's not necessarily part of his or her job description but demonstrates their contribution to added value. Established based upon a negotiated relationship, absolutely. Oh, but it's not in their job description. Oh, you mean you're gonna give them added value because they make a contribution to improve the organization? I heard about that complaint too. How many people have a published document when they're done with their master's program? Pretty significant, don't you think? First off, I'm Ms. Thornley, right? 
pretty significant to be able to add to your resume. Going on a job interview, this is one of the papers that I wrote as part of my academic experience. I think that'll help. Feel free to choose. Again, mutual responsibilities are involved and the formal document defines who's going to do what. Because unless you have a plan that identifies who's going to do what, by when, with what result, and at what, with what cost, you're in trouble. But one of the interesting things is that you create one of those plans and you also do something very important regarding it. You create a guidance team. Oh, isn't that interesting? Well, we know about those. A guidance team is what? It helps an organization go through a change successfully, right? Yes, sir. According to Cotter, who's the expert on it, leading change, a guidance team is critical for the success of any meaningful change process. Well, according to Joyner, Schultes, and Stribal, I've got to get the authors right, and their 2018 publication, The Team Handbook, third edition. You guys have that one? You have to have a guidance team to successfully ensure that the follow-up takes place appropriately so that the successful implementation of a process can occur. Anybody ever hear Jeff, Jeff Pfeffer from Stanford? I think maybe he knows what he's talking about. Stanford University, Jeff Pfeffer, one of the most published and respected scholars in the world. He says, <coughs> it ain't easy developing a plan, but it's much easier than implementing it. Did we implement it in Garden City? Well, inflation went up 36% over four years. Our operating budget at that same time went up 1.3%. We cut taxes two of the four years. According to a metric of satisfaction with city services, the scope and quality of city services have improved in every city department in that same four year period. Were we successful in our implementation? Oh, our employee relations program, oh, that has to do something with negotiations when you're in the union state, right? Employment, our employee relations program was featured at two national conferences, including the National League of Cities Conference that year. But what do they know, right? <coughs> the most important part, once you're done with any ethical dilemma problem is to reaffirm the relationship. And this step is often overlooked. We forget the fact that you're not about tasks, you're about purpose, right? We get the conquest of technique over purpose, of where the gold lead stall. When we focus on, oh, well, we've got to do A and B and C, we've got to be very rule oriented. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't get the job done when rules get in the way of what you're really trying to accomplish. And the most difficult task for this group is going to be to prepare yourself to sell yourself to somebody who knows what's going on in business. And to do that by your ability to research and write. Because you're going to have to submit a resume, but more than that, it's not, you're not going to bluff them on a 30 second summary on an, ele on an elevator ride. I want you to know that right now. My PhD is in human resource management. I am, you can look it up, but go to the Office of Personnel Management website and look up the name Cam Caldwell, and it will show, it will be a source document for testing and selection. I know how to do that. But feel free to choose. I've written two books in human resource management. What do I know, right? It's just been published in the last year. Feel free to choose what you want to do with your career. Dale Carnegie wrote a wonderful book. He wrote a book, How to Influence and Influence People. 
Can anybody read that? I bet you read it. Did you read it? Pretty good. Not too far. Maybe it's too far. Kennedy says, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain. Most fools do. Max Dupre wrote a wonderful book. His book was Leadership is an Art. He talked about the fact that employees are owned what he called a covenantal duty. A covenantal duty? What does that mean? The relationship between people that are successful in organizations if you're going to negotiate effectively, it's going to be to create a covenantal relationship where there's sacred responsibilities to treat other people with dignity and respect, with love. Oh, what does that have to do with? I just wrote a book, Leading with Love. What do you think of that? Did that buy into that concept quite the pray? Yeah. Article just came out in. The Graziadio Business Review last month. Love the heart of the issue. You gotta love people. You gotta care about them. You gotta honor the covenantal duty to treat them like you, not it. To help them be successful. And to recognize that if you're gonna have a negotiated relationship that makes any sense at all. There's going to be a two-way set of responsibilities. Where people genuinely care about each other. And you don't get hung up on a bologna sausage. That's a polite term. But we tend to do that in this world, particularly when we go through a stage called counter-dependence. Oh, we heard about that message. Counter-dependence. That's a kind of good message. Is that a parent, adult, or child state? It's a child state. Anyway, Prey in his book says something really powerful. He said, the first task of a leader is to define reality. That's your job, folks. between opinion and fact, have the courage to do what's right, have the integrity to honor who you are. It begins where? You remember four circles? Remember that in the Zima? Four circles? First one, do you remember what that is? You know, intrapersonal. That's where you show your integrity when times get tough. You stand up and say, I call buckshot. And then you honor relationships at the dyadic level. That's the next circle, isn't it? And you treat people like they matter. And you're honest and straightforward. And the higher level, the third level, is the organizational level. What are we really trying to do here as an MSG program? Well, let's define that. What if our students have 10th grade writing skills? What if they've never done any research significantly before? Some of you have, some of you are very good readers. There's a double handful in both classes that are good writers. But there are 83 in the group. Take that double handful away from 83. You know the numbers. You saw the papers I sent back. I got this balderdash saying, well, Ken, we're just talking to him about writing skills. I said, uh-uh, no. When they give me research from a commercial, when they make such statements as communication, pardon me, negotiation is communication. And the most important responsibility of negotiation is communication. I say, well, isn't that a circular argument? Is it? Negotiation, communication, well, well, 
Yeah, but that's just the kickoff. You know, that doesn't get you even to the first boy from scratch, does it? And what it gets you is somebody saying, what's wrong with this picture? When people come to my offices and they say, uh, mm, yeah, I'm making this presentation and I haven't done squat in a bucket to prepare an eight figure doctor called what? What am I supposed to do? And who let you get that far? Who let you get that far to think you could get away with that bull? Now, some of you don't deserve this. Some of you do, and you know it, don't you? Feel free to choose. Any of you that have kids? How many parents here? <coughs> okay. You ever hear of love and logic? Love and logic is kind of a teaching tool that we use. Uh, we use it a lot in elementary schools. And it basically says, there are choices. You can do A or you can do B. You don't get to choose. If you do A, you can shape. If you will, you succeed. The covenantal obligation again is to articulate what the expected level of performance is, correct? That, that's just a moral obligation of any leader. And a teacher is certainly a, a moral leader, isn't it? He or she. But the other one is that if you do this, here are the consequences. But feel free to choose. Who's got the responsibility? The child. Well, hopefully the adults, right? I don't think the people who are the real problem are here today. <clears throat> Site majors here? Okay. Site majors. Site professor was uh, very well respected, great academic, great scholar, wonderful scholar. Getting the final exam, didn't like to do grading or not, so he just said, well, this is just going to be final exam. And it's an advanced course, and it's like, question is, what are the two most significant problems of interpersonal failure? Good question? For a second there? Anyway, he thought it was. What did he know? He was only a professor. Well, one of the wags in his room wrote, I don't know, and I don't care. So, the professor returned the files. He got an A. The answer was ignorance and apathy. There are, what is it, four classes of knowing? I don't know, but I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, but I know that I don't know. I know, but I don't know that I know. And I know, and I know, I know. Where are you with regards to your master's degree? Where are you with your careers? You may never see me again. Feel free to choose. Have a good day.